Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, my name is Aslan and basically just to give you some perspective, uh, I represent a group of uh, private equity based out of uh, Hong Kong and London and we have the presentation that I will present to you is focused on one of our investments. Um, and the focus is on the, the economic value of why to do green. So it's not only just about the technology parts of green, um, the activist part of being green. I mean, sometimes being green, you know, we, we say, oh, we have to be green, we have to do recycling, we have to uh, convert waste. So the focus here is on the, on the business and the economic uh, reasons. And we have uh, this particular investment, which is called Eno Integrasi, the focus here is on the palm oil industry. Okay? Uh, my role within Eno Integrasi is industry development. So my focus is not on, on, I mean, we actually do business development and things of that nature, but the way we look at green is on an industry level. We have to engage the whole industry, we have to work with governments, uh, we have to work with private companies, we have to build an ecosystem, okay? So if within this crowd here, any of you are interested to participate uh, in industry development as one of our partners, uh, do come up and please have a, ch uh, a chance to talk to me, or our booth is located in the Biotech Corp booth, uh, just around the corner. Okay, uh, the key to what we do is biological assets, okay? Bio biological assets in this case is the palm oil industry. Now this is a snapshot of the situation in the palm oil industry. Uh, and we have targeted both Malaysia and Indonesia. As you can see, Indonesia is uh, almost double the size of Malaysia in terms of hectareage. Now this industry, if you think about it, in Malaysia it started almost a bit more than 100 years ago. But if you think of palm oil as a global crop, it is a very, very young crop. You know, we're talking about crops like, uh, like wine, you know, like grapes for vineyards, uh, oranges, apples, that has a much, much uh, longer history of cultivation. So palm oil as a crop actually is a very, very new crop. Now in terms of how the palm oil industry is, um, is shaped, there are three main concerns that affect the productivity of those biological assets as well as the cost. And as a business person, these are the most important elements. The first one, if you look at the bottom, sorry, is fertilizers. Fertilizers represent easily about half the cost of running a plantation, okay? And fertilizer prices never drop. They get higher and higher, partly because some of the fertilizers, in fact, a lot of the fertilizers are derived from uh, petroleum uh, byproducts such as urea. So if petrol prices go up, as you can imagine, it has been going up for, for decades, then the cost of fertilizers will go up. The other issue is uh, sustainability. Now this issue is primarily driven by the buyers of palm oil. You know, companies like Nestle, uh, the NGOs based in Europe. They are the ones that insist that it is sustainable. And in Malaysia and Indonesia, in this case uh, ISPO, this, the Indonesian government has taken responsibility to set up their own, uh, they call it Indonesia Sustainable Palm Oil uh, NGO to deal with sustainability issues uh, in the plantation. And the reason why there are issues with sustainability is because a lot of the waste that comes from processing uh, palm oil, like for example, they call it empty fruit bunches, palm oil mill effluent, those degrade and become methane. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. It's 21 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. 
Now the other issue is something called gynoderma. Now gynoderma is, uh, in, in some traditional Chinese medicine, gynoderma is actually a very good fungus. But in palm oil, gynoderma is a cancer, it's a disease. And it is a specific disease that attack uh, palm oil trees that have been uh, used to uh, chemical fertilizers. So they, they, are, they are fed, they basically if you can imagine they are fed chemical fertilizers every day and the soil condition becomes acidic, it becomes hard, there's no aeration. So a disease like gynoderma, a fungus, thrives on this type of situation. And this is a, a, a very difficult epidemic. Talk a little bit about gynoderma here. In Malaysia, 50% of all the estates, and this is uh, from the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, 50% of estates have gynoderma. Okay? Which means that gynoderma, like, a, like any disease, like any fungus, will, will grow. Yeah? If the conditions are ripe, they will just grow. In some cases, they can grow very, very rapidly. The problem with uh, some of the things that the palm oil industry has been doing recently is there's been a lot of uh, replanting. And replanting has accelerated Ganoderma disease. If they do not clean or sanitize the areas properly for Ganoderma, then if you were to replant, the trees that were, the new trees are also infected uh, by Ganoderma. And so, uh, this is an illustration of what happens in terms of the economic loss if there is an infestation gynoderma. Here we're talking about relatively small numbers, but some estates, especially in, in areas like in Johor, for example, it's not 5% anymore, it's more like 50 to 60% okay, after replanting. So it can be devastating uh, if you are putting your investments and even more so if you are a small holder, can you imagine if you are a small holder and if as a small holder you have this type of disease. So you're looking at income drops that are significant. Now that's part one, lah, income drops. But I also tell people uh, in an in a apocalyptic way, I said, can you imagine for a moment that if a disease like this takes hold, Malaysia will literally be a desert. A desert with dead trees or semi-dead trees. So if you were to fly, you see everything is kind of green, but actually there's no life. There's no uh, biodiversity. There's no uh, proper way of cultivating their land. You're talking about creating deserts in a tropical uh, climate. So this is why I, I, I think this is a very important thing for us to, to address. Now, what we have done is, our, our group is, we have come up with a model that actually uh, have been implemented for uh, almost, uh, almost five years now. So, what we do is, we build a, if you can see, this is our um, waste treatment plant. And what we do is, we take all the waste streams from the palm oil mill, and we actually recycle all of it back to the plantations, okay? And once it's uh, recycled back, this organic material actually contains nutrients as well as microbes that can deal with Ganoderma and other diseases, and it improves the, the health of the trees and it improves the capacity of the, uh, of the plantations to reduce fertilization costs, to extend the lifespan and so forth. And because we are part of the uh, BioNexus uh, Biotech Corps uh, program, we have been nominated by the Malaysian government in the Pemandu Transformation Program to do 50 sites. 50 sites represent about 10% of all the palm oil mills. So what are some of the challenges huh, that we face? The first challenge is, I'm not sure how much the crowd knows about carbon credits, but a lot of projects that try to reduce carbon based on carbon credits, they fail. 
That is uh, one of the things that not only happens in Malaysia, but happens all over the world. So what happens is it becomes unsustainable. The business model is unsustainable. The investors all run away. I know many investors that have run away from Malaysia. I am the biggest skeptic of foreign investors. <laughs> I am one of the biggest skeptic. So they try to do something in Malaysia. Normally they are like biogas. Biogas is a typical example where the main source of income is carbon credits. And when the carbon credit, when the carbon prices drop, uh, when it's very difficult to get carbon credits, a lot of them actually um, uh, leave the country and do something else. The other issue is a lot of deployment also is, uh, how shall I describe it? Uh, people are trying to sell you their technology. They want you to buy the technology. They're not trying to solve your problem. And they go into plantations not knowing exactly how to integrate the issues in palm oil, the milling process, the waste treatment, and so forth. So when they go in there, forcing themselves, technology upon the industry, then there is also the, uh, the rebellion that happens within the industry. So if you talk to some of the other plantation groups, if you have a chance to talk to some of the bigger plantation groups and even the small ones, you can see carcasses of projects that fail. Because one, the business model doesn't work, but two, the palm oil mill managers and people do not support the project. It doesn't solve any of their problems. In fact, it creates problem and create work for them. Now, there are some instances where you know, people would come to me and say, hey, Azlan, this is composting. What's so special about this? And part of the issue is a lot of people don't understand the biological challenges when it comes to improving yield. So a lot of them base their composting solutions on semi-composted semi organic matter. And semi-composted organic matter is a double-edged sword. If it's semi-treated, you either get the good half or the bad half. So if you're lucky, you get the good half, everything works well, the bad half doesn't affect your plant. But if you have the, the one that's untreated, you actually attract other types of diseases and you are basically delivering disease back into the, into the field. Our particular solution is about one hectare in size. The way we approach it is that all waste streams from the palm oil mill, every single molecule, every single carbon molecule of waste, we collect. It goes direct to our waste treatment plant. We work very, very closely with the palm oil mill. Our, the palm oil mill is our partners. We design our waste treatment plant around the palm oil mill, not the other way around. Okay, we, make the, we make life easy for the palm oil mill. It takes about nine months to build one of our plants. It's very fast. We can, and in fact we are in, in serious discussions to integrate biogas capture to generate power. And there is an option that if you do have an existing composting plant, we can actually integrate that as well. So this is some of the pictures of our plant. Okay. Usually when people come to our plant, there, there is no smell, there's, it's a clean environment, completely clean. Everything is treated. Now if I were to compare our InnoWorks um, system with existing waste treatment or composting systems, and, and these are and examples of systems that exist in the world today, if you compare an indoor system, sorry, an outdoor system, you need about more than 10 hectares of space. Indoor system, which basically prevents rain or diverts uh, rain into, uh, uh, into uh, longkang, uh, longkang, drain, sorry, um, they take about almost four hectares. I was only take one hectare. Okay? I was only take one hectare. In terms of protection, ours is enclosed. In terms of the composting number of days, this one takes about 90 days, 45 days. Ours only takes 14 days and it's completely natural. 
Okay, completely natural. And that's important. You don't need to intervene putting in chemicals or physical processes in order to achieve this 14 days. Now what is important here is that producing, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about profits. Okay? And ours, compared to the other systems here, we are fully compliant uh, to reducing carbon and we have something called a high CFU count. Now that is important because when we introduce bio-organic fertilizers, we want to make sure that the good microbes that we add in are at the highest possible number. I always have a, a very lively discussion about microbes with scientists. And some of the scientists will say, oh, uh, Azlan, I have the best microbe in the world. Okay? And I said, okay. Then when they describe the microbe, I says, oh, um, if any one of you follow football, I said, oh, you have the uh, Lionel Messi of microbes. Oh, you have the Cristiano Ronaldo of microbes. But what I have is, I have the equivalent of uh, Stoke, uh, QPR. <laughs> sorry. Okay, sorry. I was thinking, talking to me. So I have Stoke, I have QPR, I have Everton. So basically I have five or six football teams and you have Lionel Messi and you have Cristiano Ronaldo. Who will win? I don't have superstar microbes. I just have four football teams on the field and you have two players. Okay? And that's how you fight disease. When you fight disease, it's like fighting a war. You don't send one player or two players out there to fight the disease, you send a whole army. You contain them, you fight them, you, you cut them slowly until they just have no will to fight you anymore. That's how you overcome plant disease. So I always have this lively discussion with the UPM scientists. Science, yeah. they all, at the end of the day, they all agree with me. They say, yeah, Aslan, you are correct. That's why we have high CFU count. So this is just a simple illustration. And this is what we strive to do. We are going towards zero discharge. So our plan here is that eventually everything that happens in a palm oil mill, all the solid, semi-solid waste, all the palm oil mill effluent, everything becomes a product that has an income stream. Okay. Now this is actually a very s simple model of what we are doing where we actually produce uh, bio-organic fertilizers, uh, biogas that can be fed back into the palm oil mill for power generation or generate power. We are in fact looking at a model where we can actually sell water back to the palm oil mill. We can actually introduce uh, some technologies that can uh, make better efficient use of the uh, waste so that we produce uh, chemicals, biochemicals, biopolymers, and so forth. But eventually, the whole idea is towards zero discharge, zero pollution, completely friendly to the environment. Now, in order to, to make this happen, we have to work with the Malaysian government. We have to work with every part of the Malaysian government and this is the, the beauty of the, uh, the bioeconomy program where Biotech Corp became the facilitator for us to work with all the different uh, agencies. You know, for example, we work very closely with uh, MPOB, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, uh, and Mardi UPM, for example. And if you are familiar with Cradle, Cradle is an agency that gives out funding, early stage funding. So we actually work for Cradle so that whoever wants to partner with us, you can go to Cradle, you can apply for a grant. Okay? Based on the fact that you are going to work with Inno Integrasi. Okay? And there's also uh, debt financing available. Uh, and these are some of the other agencies. NRE for carbon registry. So if some of you remember, I was the earlier presentation when I asked the Malacca person, I said, you know, maybe you could offset some of your carbon. You can actually buy carbon from us through the NRE registry right here. 
And we are also working with people like Martrade, Miti, KKLW. So again, the whole ecosystem within the government, we are completely engaged. But I would have to say that the most important is MPOB, uh, and at today uh, is MPOB and Biotech Corp. Uh, eventually, the participation of uh, MOA, KK, MPOA, M, uh, KKLW is going to be more and more significant as we roll out this program. Now, one of the reasons why we were nominated in the, I, I got four minutes, right? Esther, I got four minutes. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Um, it's because we have data. A lot of projects I notice don't have data or their data is very weak. You know, it's collected by them. They, and no one really believes it's their data. Ours is actually all third party independent data. And this is the most impressive data. We are able to increase uh, by 40%, more than 40% of the CAT ion exchange capacity. Now, CAT ion exchange capacity represents the ability of the tree's roots to absorb nutrients. Okay? And this is one of the important agronomic data. So you go to an agronomist, you show this data, they're like, okay, you got my attention. The other important piece of data is uh, AL plus H. AL, AL plus H are heavy metals, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, heavy metals that uh, inhibit the uptake of nutrients. So that one decreased by 33%. So this is some of the information. Another thing to point out is, uh, if you can see this number, 7.5 kg per pound per year. If I were to, if you look at say some of the plantation groups when they do uh, composting they base it on nutrient replacement the average per tree is a hundred kg per tree so can you imagine a hundred kg compared to our 7.5 kg so we are far more efficient in the in terms of recycling the biomass back into the plantation Okay, this is just a partner of ours. Remember earlier I mentioned to you about working with us? So this is a company, Microwell. It is a, uh, a subsidiary of uh, Jacob. And they also are partners because they have very interesting products. In fact, just a few days ago, I was with Microwell and MPOB to develop a new product specific to Ganoderma that attacks Ganoderma at the, at the, at the core. Okay, so they have their data and so forth. Okay, I got two minutes. So, these are the potential gains. So, for a plantation about this size, which represents about one palm oil mill, in terms of fertilization, US dollars, it's about a million US dollars, almost a million. We are able to uh, increase yield by one we are able to, to justify a one metric ton increase. The average yield increase that we have done so far is about three to five metric tons per hectare. And this is all verified by, uh, by the agencies that we work with. Um, so if you just model it on a financial basis, we're looking at an income of almost 2.3 million US dollars. Okay? So these are some of the numbers. And also on carbon reduction, we're looking at 30 to 60,000 tons of carbon. This is just for one site. Huh? So in Malaysia, if you can imagine, there are almost, almost 500 sites. It's about 470-ish or 480. Now, we don't stop there. When we talk about sustainability, we are actually looking at going direct to smallholders. We are looking at using unmanned vehicles to do mapping. So we know better about what are the, what are the, how precise we are with the fertilizers. And we are also introducing mobility applications for farmers. So they also are able to buy fertilizers and check on productivity as well. Last slide, huh, Esther. So a summary, yeah? 
adopt, adapt and advance. Okay? Yalah, you know, kena ada tagline kan. So, adopt, adapt and advance. So, when we start when the industry started in the 80s, it was all landfill and lagoons. In the 90s, it was open air windrow composting. Uh, last 10 years ago, it was covered window, but now we're looking at an integrated bioformulation for soil remediation, precise biocontrol agents, precise agriculture, carbon reduction, self-sustaining biogas. So all of it is encapsulated in this program with government participation. Okay, so take away, eh? um, farm sustainable management, Yes, environmental responsibility, yes, integrated with mill, yes, uh, carbon savings, yes. So moving with ISPO, MSPO is, uh, we are in a good and strong position to do this. So Mr. Aslan Yaakob, any last word to wrap up? Because our next oh, speaker I'm is on the line. Okay, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. So, <laughs> so I guess to, uh, to summarize, uh, we can make money from uh, green, um, but you really, really need to understand two things, science and numbers. So in our group, we've got guys, uh, guys and gals, okay? We have people that can understand how to make it work economically, but at the same token, we work very closely with the scientists uh, in order to get something like this happen. Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor?